Thank you so much, team. I appreciate that. Here a couple of weeks ago, Stephen Curry of the, what is it? The Warriors. And uh, he came out and he said he didn't believe that man landed on the moon. <laughs> that Steve Porter believes that too, by the way. That's why we're firing him right now. Now, I just... <laughs> But uh, NASA invited him down, by the way, and said, come on down, we'll show you a few things so you can change your mind. <laughs> it was funny. And uh, there's some, I believe, the earth is flat, too. That's an interesting theory, too. There's all kinds of theories in there. But anyway, there was a time in history when both the moon and the earth were visited by aliens to them. And I want to talk about that today. Uh, Psalm 8, verse 1. He says, uh, O Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Verse 3 and 4, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. And I was thinking of that as I was preparing this, and uh, we remember years ago, some of us older ones, when in school the classes would stop and we'd all watch uh, America's first space launches. Uh, we went crazy when Russia sent up the Sputnik. You remember that? And they said, boy, that thing's going around watching us. <laughs> I, I remember that. And the space race began. And they tried to say, who's going to be first to, in space? And the Russians beat us. Who's going to be first to do this? The Russians beat us. And then they said, let's go to the moon. And finally, on July 20th, 1969, astronaut Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon. The millions were watching on TV. Michigan Trove burst out in joy and cheering with excitement. Some statistics I thought that were interesting Going to the moon, the moon is 238,000 miles away. The Saturn rocket was 363 feet high. Our monument, Sailor's Monument Circle downtown Indianapolis where they have the Christmas tree, uh, that is 284 feet. So the Saturn rocket was even 79 feet higher than that. It weighed 6,698,700 pounds. When they got toward the moon, their orbit of the moon was at 50,000 feet. The Eagle module descended to 500 feet, where Neil Armstrong manually took control and for one and a half minutes guided it until they had a clear landing site. And for that one and a half minutes, he finally landed in the Sea of Tranquility, and he only had 23 seconds of fuel left when he landed that. On July the 19th at 10.56 p.m., Armstrong stepped out onto the moon, and he said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He actually said, they didn't pick it up, that's one small step for a man. And they didn't pick up that A, that, that was kind of interesting. Overall, over our history, there's been 12 astronauts that have walked on the moon. This amazing feat was the combination of years of planning and testing of man and machine. From our first space man who went to space, Alan Shepard, to orbiting the Earth with John Glenn, to the new spacecraft and going to the moon with Armstrong and the others. However, 2,000 plus years ago, an event much more amazing, so much more significant took place. God himself, he also visited this earth. Now that's an amazing event. That's better than landing on the moon, by the way. We celebrate this historic event each year. And we say Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. Now these two visits, even though the coming of Christ is so much more significant, they had some similarities. 
And I thought I'd, I'd make those comparisons. Man going to the moon, the years of preparation. It took several years of hard work. The Apollo program in 1961, John F. Kennedy challenged America to go to the moon. Before they got there, they went through the Mercury rockets, Gemini, the Ranger, Surveyor, Orbiter, and all the things that they learned technology-wise, and their preparation made it possible. Likewise, God's coming to earth. It was decided years prior to his coming before it ever became a reality. In 1 Peter 1.20, it says this, who verily Christ was for ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or come to appear in these last times for you. So before the world was ever created, God already purposed that his son would become flesh upon this earth. In order for God to come to earth, his preparation was getting man ready for his arrival. God did this through the prophets to Israel and for Israel. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me, God, the Lord, Christ, and the Lord. And then in Micah 5.2, he says this, in Micah 5.2, Behold, thou, or, but thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old and from everlasting. In other words, he's eternity. And his name is Jesus Christ. There are 300 promises concerning the first coming of Christ, every one fulfilled, to have man looking for Christ's arrival. And then man going to the moon took great intellect, wisdom, and power. Apollo took the combined intellects that America had with a few German and Jewish scientists, engineers, test pilots, technicians, mathematicians, computer geeks. Remember, the moon is a quarter million miles away, and it required the most powerful rocket, rocket ever built, and that was, that was Saturn V. There's never been a rocket that powerful since that time, as a matter of fact. God, though, coming to earth, likewise, God demonstrated his wisdom and his power. Mankind on his own had become sinful and helpless and hopeless. But God sent forth his amazing plan to redeem man. And the way that he would do it would be that God came to earth himself. Born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, became the sin bearer on the cross by shedding his blood and dying. And in his power, he broke the chains, the control of Satan and death by resurrecting from the dead. He's alive today. Amen. Ephesians 1, 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? And so that power broke the chains of sin and death itself. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then man going to the moon was at great cost. Apollo program, 40 years plus years ago, cost 30 plus billion dollars. You translate, translate that into today's economy and it would actually add up to trillions of dollars. But likewise, when God came to earth, God also paid a huge price. It cost him. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, God was willing to give up his son. Romans 8.32 confirms that. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give to us all things? 
1 Peter 1, 18, 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. God gave his only son to be sacrificed for our sins. I remember one time I went to St. Francis Hospital and the Waltz at that time, uh, they had a home for girls, unwed girls. And I remember I went to the hospital and a little girl by the name of Michelle, she wanted to see her baby and then she gave the baby away. I was there and how a mom, knowing what's best for the child, she was giving that baby away. And then I thought, I wonder what it was like for God, the Father, when God the Son, he sent, knowing he's going to have to go through what he went through. It was a great cost, wasn't it? And then man going to the moon uh, had to have precise timing. Everything had to be precise on schedule, the launch time, when to start the thruster rockets, the exact angle into the moon orbit, exact, exact burn to descend to the moon's surface. Fuel consumption was critical. Any deviation from their schedule would be disastrous. There was just a small window for them to be able to accomplish this. Likewise, when God came to the earth, God's wisdom followed his exact schedule. Before the world began, it was planned. He created this purpose. And after 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, God said he would come and he came. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman made under the law. He says in Luke 2.11 and 12, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And he came to Israel. Then he was to go to the world. When man went to the moon, it was accomplished by three people, in a sense. Apollo 11 had three men. Only two descended to the lunar surface. Astronaut Collins stayed in the orbiting ship, the spacecraft, and he assisted the two other astronauts down on the moon's surface. Likewise, God, when he came to earth, the Trinity, the three in one, worked together. The Father remained in orbit in heaven, <laughs> yet helped the Son, the Holy Spirit, to accomplish his purpose on earth. He says in 1 Peter 1, 2, he says this here, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, one, through the sanctification of the Spirit, two, unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, three, grace unto you. So the Father and the Spirit and the Son always work together as one. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, one, who through the eternal Spirit, two, offered himself without spot to God, three, the, that's the Father. And then 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy, Holy Ghost be with you all. There you have three once again. They always work together as one. Then when man went to the moon, they had special body suits. The astronauts could not go to the moon in their original makeup, their natural bodies. They needed a special suit to live in the moon's atmosphere its airlessness and environment. They needed protection while at the same time oxygen or air. Likewise, when God came to the world, God is a spirit and he needed to put on a special sinless body. Christ needed a body to accomplish salvation's plan. Remember this, God cannot die. So he needed a sinless body to indwell, to die for our sins on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That happens when you get saved. Amen? Now how did he do this? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, Who being in the form of God, Christ, 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, flesh. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word what? Verse 14 says this, And the Word, God, Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, okay, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's how He did it. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ, Him, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's 100% man, 100% God, in order so he could be our mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I've said before, as God, he could take the hand of the Father, and as man, he could take the hand of man and restore and reconcile a broken relationship that was broken because of sin. He died for that sin. Amen? And then man going to the moon, they landed in an unspectacular place. The astronauts left home, a planet of beauty and life, to land on a drab, lifeless place. We've seen the pictures, haven't we? There was no air, no oceans, no blue sky, but only darkness, dust, scars, ugly, insignificant, rock. <laughs> But likewise, when God came to earth in comparison, he left the beauty and the glory of paradise of heaven with all its praises going on from the angelic hosts. Yet he came to this dark, sinful, diseased, dying, doomed world of humanity, not in a palace or a cathedral, but in a little village of Bethlehem, in a stable, in a manger where the animal feeding trough was. Luke 2, 12 says this here, And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. How could he do this? Why did he do this? 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. He did this for us. For us, he did that. Man going to the moon, they were cheered upon their arrival. There was great jubilation when they said the lunar module had landed. Eagle has touched down. Mission control went bonkers. All the news, the press, the TV watchers, most of the world was watching in, broke out in admiration of their achievement. And back in those days, for us older people, we know exactly where we were when that took place. I was in a, on a farm in Ohio at some friends of the family, and we watched it that evening. Likewise, though, when God came to earth, when God arrived on the earth, there was some rejoicing. No doubt Mary rejoiced. She sang it truly happened. But no one else on earth at that moment was rejoicing. There was just silence, no applause, no fanfare. But in heaven and finally in the air of our earth, the angelic hosts began to shout and praises given to God. Luke 2, 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men because the Prince of Peace had come. And we look at that. Salvation's plan at that moment was set in motion. The impossible had become a fact. God in flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in flesh. Amen? And it's in the person of Christ. And then man going to the moon... Their moon stay was brief. In spite of the many years of preparing to land on the moon, these visitors stayed on the lunar surface a relatively short period of time. They actually stayed on the surface 
21 hours and 36 minutes. Just enough time to fulfill their mission. Likewise, when God came to earth, his stay was also short in comparison to his eternity. Now, don't forget this. Christ has always existed as God the Son in eternity past. He never had a beginning. He never had a beginning. He always has existed as the Son, the second person of the Godhead. Always. But when he came to the earth here, uh, that had been promised 4,000 years prior in Genesis 3.15. It was planned even before the foundation of the world, yet he spent only 33 years on earth and perhaps only two and a few months, two years and a few months in his ministry. Remember, the priests didn't start their ministry until they were how old? 30 years old. Christ is the great high priest, didn't he? And he was a priest, and he began his ministry in the wilderness with John the Baptist at the age of 30. And then his ministry was about two and a half years, I believe that's correct. But he stayed exactly long enough to fulfill his father's purpose. And his father's purpose was for him to pay for our sins, for Israel to be saved and establish her earthly kingdom, and for the body of Christ to be saved and to establish their future home called heaven. He says in John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The Son says that to the Father. And verse 9, chapter 19, verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And I might just make a side comment here. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant, Everything necessary to complete salvation for mankind, to wash away sins and give man the opportunity to be able to say is accomplished by what he did on the cross. And there's a lot of grips going around saying the cross was not enough. They say he had to go to hell for three days and suffer torment and punishment in hell. No, they're crazy. They're denying the finished work of Christ. Paul says... I'm just going to glory in that cross and that alone. It's the preaching of that cross that saves people because it's the person who died there. The last point I make, man going to the moon, these visitors left some things and a memorial behind. When the astronauts departed the moon, they left behind footprints, an American flag, part of a space shuttle, scientific instruments, and also a memorial plaque. And the memorial plaque said this, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon July 1969 A.D. I thought that was interesting, after the death of Christ. We came in peace for all mankind. Signed by Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr., by the way, who had a secret communion service with himself on the moon. That's true. And he made the statement, we are not alone. <laughs> he knew God. And the other person who signed it was Richard Nixon. Isn't that interesting? And that's on that plaque up there likewise when God came to earth when Christ left behind he left some footprints on this earth he left behind a blood stained cross and an empty tomb as his memorial I've been to Jerusalem I've seen the empty tomb you have the one version of the Catholic church and you go inside this building and so on and you you just sense darkness. That's just a fact. 
But when you go to Gordon's Calvary, the place of the skull, and you go there, it's as if the Spirit of God's jumping all over that place. That's true. And we saw that. We went inside, and you could see where they had cut out a little extra space because evidently Jesus was taller than Joseph of Arimathea. And so they made room for Jesus. And uh, so uh, we've seen that, and he's left that behind. But he also left behind his message of hope. He said, hey, listen, if I fulfilled all the promises and I came the first time, I want you to know something. I'm coming back again. Amen. 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 <laughs> you can trust it. My first proves my second coming. And he says he's coming. That's our message today. The message today for mankind is the fact that they're sinners. Without Christ, you die. Without Christ, you you're empty, you're trying to fill it with the world, the flesh, everything that the world offers you, and you keep coming up empty. Huh? There's only one person who can fill that, and that's Jesus Christ. And he died, he was buried, he rose again, and if you would believe that gospel of grace message, even today, you can be saved today, knowing that he's coming back for you to take you to heaven. Amen? Now, if you don't, you have to pay the consequences. Nobody likes to talk about the consequences, do they? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction and from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. You'll have to go into tribulation. And if you even survive the tribulation, uh, chances are you won't, but if you happen to, you still will have that take place. But for the child of God, we don't worry about him coming back. For the child of God, we're looking forward to it. Because we know 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive, we've been saved, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? That's our hope because we put our faith in the gospel alone. That's not church membership, not baptism, not you living a good life, not you giving any money, nothing you do. It's all been accomplished by Jesus Christ. Your faith has to be in him and him alone. Total trust from your heart. Amen? Amen. And then you can say Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This time of the year... There's a special emphasis upon Christ coming the first time. And we rejoice that people might stop and pause, but we hope that the Spirit of God will work that will show them the real reason for this season is in the person of Christ and why he came, who he was and why he came, what he did for us. And if we believe that, then the next time he comes, We'll be there, and he'll say, come on up. Let's go to heaven. I don't know about you. That gives me great hope. I look at this world right now, and I see it crumbling, coming apart, and you can just ride across it, no hope. One day it's this. The next day it's this. People running to and fro have no clue to finding real peace. Does it bother us when we see this? Of course it does. But as we back up and we stay true to the word of God and believe what God's word says, we know this is not the end. Uh, we know there's a greater day coming for us. And we put our faith in that. How about you? Let's bow our heads. With heads bowed, you would say, Pastor Jim, if I were to die right now, I don't know where I would spend eternity. Or I do know where I will spend eternity, but it won't be with Christ. 
I sure want to change that. God's Spirit's moved on my heart, and I believe this Christmas cross, empty tomb message for my life. If you just would say in your heart, right where you're sitting right now, something like this, just say it in your heart, dear God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. But I do believe that your son died for my sins was buried and rose again. God, I tell you, this moment at this time, I believe the gospel with all my heart. In Jesus' name, I pray that. And if you pray that in your heart and you meant it in your heart, if you just believed, God says he saved you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the one who came for us, who died for us, who rose for us, who's coming for us. God, we're so undeserving. We don't deserve this love. But for some reason, in your mercy and your grace, you've demonstrated the greatest story that ever could be told. And God, today we just want to say thank you. We worship you. We praise you. May our lives be testimonies of the gospel of grace message. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.